My friends, who will walk on water with me? You are looking for a figure who will draw your country towards war. Yes. Arins is your man. I was playing Shylock in uh, The Merchant of Venice at Stratford-on-Avon. I was one of the youngest ever leading men there. I was what, about 27, 8 and convinced that, you know, I was going to be the, the, the Shakespearean actor. And I got a phone call out of the blue from David Lean. Would it be possible for me to come to London? And if it were possible, could we have a little meeting? And I had a few days off and I went down and everybody in the world was to play Lawrence of Arabia except me. And David, he had in those days uh, an Indian wife, Leela, and she traveled around with a guru the guru had gone to see a little black and white movie called The Day They Robbed the Bank of England, in which I play a young English army officer. And he'd gone to David and said, I've just seen the man who must play Lawrence of Arabia. So David went to see the picture. I mean, seen the picture, that's when he telephoned me. So we sat together, David and me, in a, in a restaurant. And we talked generally about one thing and another. And he wanted to do a camera test. So there was a mound of sand in the studio. And I sat in front of the pile of sand wearing the, the frock and the funny hat and then took it off and then put on an army uniform. And um, the following morning, David said, look, I want you to play Lawrence of Arabia. And the producer is Sam Spiegel. So I said, David Lean, you're in for a lot of trouble because he doesn't like me. He said, why? I said, well, I, I pulled a stunt on him about a year ago, and um, he doesn't like me at all. But David, when he stuck his heels down and was determined, nothing would deter him. So reluctantly, Spiegel agreed. And I said to David, well, I'm prepared to do it with the greatest of pleasure, but I need to read a script, because that's what I do. I make words flesh. That's my job. I mean, I can't just say I am Lawrence of Arabia. He said, look, all right, I went to an office in London and he gave me the script but I wasn't allowed to leave the room. I had to read it in the room. And then I met David later on in the afternoon and he said, what did you think? I said, it is the most beautiful adventure story. And David said, that bad? <laughs> but he then said, look, um, who are the young playwrights around? And I said, Robert Bolt. He, said, you know, so he teaches history and uh, Robert and I were friendly. The next thing I knew, Robert had taken over and he was doing the last version of the script. I flew out to Jordan, to Amman, and I was introduced to His Majesty, the late King Hussein. And he said, why have you come out so early? I said, well, I've got to learn to ride a camel. I've got to learn how to wear the robes. And in fact, just to get used to the idea of being in this and the climate, to get acclimatized, because, you know, when you get into the middle of that bloody desert, I mean, it's, it's a frying pan, and there are days when the heat hurts. And King Hussein said, well, I can introduce you to my desert patrol. And my instructor was Kutaifun Abu Tai, a grandson of Aouda Abu Tai, who was played in the film by Anthony Quinn. So I was taught to ride a camel by Aouda's grandson, which was something. But the camel was like riding a dragon, this huge, great thing. And it is not like being on a horse. You can't post or uh, you, you just bump. And nobody can ride a camel. Nobody, not even the greatest Bedouin riders. Nobody can ride a camel. You just sit on top of the damn thing and hope to God it doesn't fling you off. It is the most uncomfortable, strange feeling. And the saddles are made of wood. You can imagine my bottom was in pieces. So I had a few days off, and I used to go regularly to Beirut. And I bought about uh, a couple of yards of sponge rubber, and I shoved it on my saddle. Within a month, every Bedouin wanted some sponge rubber. So I was requisitioning yards and yards 
of sponge rubber. So my contribution to Adam civilization <laughs> is the introduction of sponge rubber for Bedouin to ride on saddles. And I was with these Bedouin for nine months. They gave me several names, but the first name the Bedouin gave me was Abu Svinge, because of the nearest they could get to sponge. And finally they called me Fahate, which I was very proud of. It means young lion. And every day was interesting, every day was... Um, and, and you can imagine working with those actors. Truly, for some men, nothing is written unless they write it. He introduced himself as Omar Sharif. And I said, no one can be called Omar Sharif. That's impossible. So I called him Cairo Fred. It was shortened by everybody else to Fred. And we became known to David as the two Freds. Los dos Freds. <laughs> Remarkable intellect and humor. And he's a graceful and a beautiful man. We just became immediately friendly. And it was like living with a young version of my father, because my father was a professional gambler. And Omar, as you know, is a superb gambler. And we just got on. We still do. We, you know, we're easy friends. The English have a great hunger for desolate places. I fear they hunger for Arabia. Then you must deny it to them. Alec had known David since he was an editor, and they'd gone on for years and years and years. And they did Oliver Twist together when he played uh, Fagin. So they knew each other very well indeed, and he always called him the boy David. And there was a wonderful moment, I remember, when Alec was out in the desert for a little while, sweating, horrible. And Alec, when the airplanes fly over, and Alec's waving his scimitar, and Tony Quayle was, we were all just hot and horrible. And Tony looked, turned around and said, oh, the glamour of it all sipping champagne all day and dressing with the actresses. <laughs> the actor's life. The Turks pay me a golden treasure, yet I am poor, because I am a river to my people. <laughs> Tony and I were friendly before he made the picture. We remained friendly. And Quinn's makeup was astonishing, and so was Alex, as you can see. Superb. Only two kinds of creature get fun of the desert, Bedouins and gods, and you're neither. Take it from me. For ordinary men, it's a burning, fiery furnace. Oh, beautiful Claude. How are you this morning, Claude? I don't know. What's the weather like? I didn't look. <laughs> and small. I had to do quite a lot of telescopic acting. I had to sort of shrink a little bit. If we were doing it in the 70 millimeter, it's different framing. So if Claude's body was in, my head was out. And if my head was in, Claude's body had gone. So we had to do strange things. I have been in Dara now for three and a half years. If they posted me to the dark side of the moon, I could not be more isolated. Joe was one of the reasons I became an actor. When I saw Cyrano de Bergerac, I mean, I, I learned most of Joe's pieces from, I should do them all for auditions. I'll give you an idea. So when we met, it was lovely. It was such a fine actor. What do you mean by coming here dressed like that? Amateur theatricals? Oh, yes, entirely. Let me see that uh, hat thing or whatever it is. People ask me who I miss the most, and I miss Jack. There never was um, a man who was so much on top of his material, on top of, uh, of himself. And yet, his sense of humor was just so rich. He was a Shakespearean, you know, Jack. I have a record of him uh, doing Othello. <laughs> Freddie Wong was superb. And not only did he uh, light the thing beautifully and extraordinarily, he knew all the bits and pieces and everything. I'll give you an example of Freddie and his commitment. Um, we needed shots of uh, camels' footprints going over a dune. Well, you can't say to a camel, would you please go over that and, uh, and do some nice footprints? So Freddie used to do them. He used to put big duster things around his feet and measured exactly a camel's stride. And Freddie would do the camel's footsteps. 
So he could light the depth of it and the, the shadows. Wonderful. And in the middle of the desert, there would be David on a, on a deck chair with his, his cigarette holder and his puffing away and thinking. And I would say, vacant or in pensive mood, David? Oh, vacant, vacant, vacant. Or, or, or pensive, pensive, pensive. He'd be thinking of dreaming. But David led from the front in every single thing we did. The thing that struck me almost immediately when we began filming was his admiration for good acting. He loved it. He was a connoisseur of good acting. He expected the best. And if you gave him the best, you had the best friend in the world. And um, the moment he began to trust me, we hardly ever spoke other than just to say, um, where are you going to sit? What are you going to do? And um, on came the scene where he's given the white robes by his Bedouin friends. David came up to me in the morning and he said, Pete, there's a hole. I said, there's a hole? He said, yes, there's a hole. I said, where? He said, there's a hole in the script between putting the robes on and meeting our old Abu Tai. Tell me, Pete, what do you think a young man would do when he wore white robes for the first time in his life? These extraordinary, beautiful silk things. He said, will you think about it? I said, in what respect? He said, well, I want a bit of mime, as it were. What would a young man do if he thought he was alone in the middle of the desert? So I was deeply honored that he trusted me. And David had picked this little semicircle of flattened desert, and behind it, this sand dune, which was against this matchless, unsaturated blue of a desert sky. He said to me, there you go, Pete. There's your stage. He put a couple of cameras on it, and he said, I need a minute. So I did all my bits and bobs. And the one thing, and this happened when I was doing the take, the one thing I thought that a young man would do would want to see himself. Well, there aren't too many mirrors in the desert or even pools of water or nothing. And I was just going past the camera, and it dawned on me that I had this big knife which is quite wide, and I pulled out the knife, and I could see myself in the knife, and I just did that, and I heard from behind the camera, clever boy. And it became a feature of the film, because in the, the later battle scene, David asked me to take the knife out again and look at this bloodied figure that had become from this touch of wedding, touch of first communion, a touch of frisky boy, a touch of all sorts of things. The innocence of it is ruined by the killing and the, the death. The innocence of it has gone. And he realizes what he's doing. And, you know, this is human life that he's playing with, like a ball. It's a profound effect on what was a scholarly, intellectual archaeologist. Do understand, he was a young man, T. E. Lawrence. He was a young man in 1916, 1917. His father died, his favorite brother was killed in France. He was emotionally wrecked. I mean, he adored his father, and he adored his brother. The effect it had on him was, was intense. And here he was, with no brief at all from the British government, uh, liaising with kings, wearing Arab clothes. I mean, nothing had ever been done like this before. Well, I can't make out whether you're bloody bad man or just half-witted. I have the same problem, sir. Shut up. Yes, sir. He never fitted into the Oxford Academy, he didn't. He never fitted into the archaeological world. He tried. He never fitted into the military world. I and mean, he used to forget to put his uniform on and turn up in a jacket, hopelessly uncomfortable in an army uniform, hopelessly uncomfortable. The one thing he did do and tried to do above anything was to unite, uh, you know, uh, this impossible dream. So he pushed himself to extremes, to amazing extremes. You tried very hard to give us Damascus. It's what I came for. But T. Lawrence was killed just after writing and publishing Seven Pillars of Wisdom. I read Seven Pillars of Wisdom as a duty when I began to do the film. But 15 years back, I read it again. And it is literature of the highest order. 
Angus Wilson in a column the other day just said that uh, when he reads Seven Pillars, he calls it the Lawrence music. I mean, that man was writing beautiful, beautiful English. He would have been England's Herman Melville. He would have written a Moby Dick. He would. So we lost not just one of the most eccentric generals and Arab leaders, but a writer of true distinction. I had the motorcycle scene to do, and that was all I had left to do. But the last shot of the film was practically the last shot of T. Lawrence in the desert. Well, sir, going home. It was my friend Brian Pringle who was the driver. We were sitting in there, hot, wearing uniform tops, but with nothing on underneath. We had our feet in buckets of ice and a drop of champagne at the side. Because it was the last shot, and I had nothing to say except stare through the window. And um, David did it over and over and over and over again. He wanted it to be perfect. Irritating at the time, but not now. But the first thing he'd said to me on the first day of shooting was, off we go, Pete, on a great adventure. And that stayed with me. Every time I was feeling a bit down or whatever, as one does, even you know, without having to be in a film in a desert, uh, I would think of that, that it, we were in a great adventure. And it was. And he just said, um, oh, Pete, we've done the adventure. We've, we've finished our adventure. And I was very moved, actually. But I could see David was, was lost. You know, he'd been his life for years. But I was so delighted to get out of the desert but I got hold of the jeep, I drove the bloody thing back to this little hotel we're in the Wazazat. I got my passport and as much money as I had, and a shirt and a pair of trousers and a jet, and I drove across the Atlas Mountains to Marrakesh, where I filled up with petrol, and I drove myself in this jeep with my foot down on the pedal to um, Casablanca because I knew Omar, who'd finished the day before, was in a nightclub called the Abreuvoir. We used to call it the Abattoir. And I wanted to get there before it closed. And, uh, <laughs> and I did. I wanted to celebrate. <laughs> David Lean was completely open about his methods have a look through here, Pete, and I would look through the lens, ah, and I'd get the picture. When he was editing, and he did it on the old sewing machine days with his gloves and his scissors, he would ring me up from time to time to show me things he was doing. He said, I want to show you love cutting, he said to me once, love cutting. He said, well, as you step from the armored car down to the ground, you're a little bit clumsy. He said, I don't want it, I want to be completely graceful. So watch, I step off the armored car, cut, to Anthony Quayle's face. And then by the time he comes back, the clumsiness has gone. And it's just a graceful descent. Love cutting. So he'd show me all sorts of things. If I was watching the film being built. And then came the first night in uh, Leicester Square. And that's the first time I saw it. I'm a bookie's son. And the first thing I do is look at the odds. And I was about third favorite. No, 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 there was a strong favorite. I remember very strong favorite indeed. But I wasn't there, I was working. And I was disappointed certainly not to win, but I wasn't surprised, for I knew what the odds were. If David had been in the military, if David had been an archaeologist, if David had been an explorer, he'd have been in the front. He was a leader, and well, there was a great bond between David and me. And I was with him when he was dying. I sat with him, and I, I taught my, took my young son to meet him. We just sat, we held hands. Talked of first loves. Yes. Great filmmaker and an astonishing man.
there are times when I'm just completely absorbed in the picture and I see it for what it is. Other times, um, people ask me if I'm fed up. No. I mean, it was one of the most beautiful experiences of my entire life. I love the history of the place. I could do that. I knew that my Bible history, my Crusader history. But I'm never fed up. I'm never fed up. I was fortunate and I, was, I felt chosen. <laughs>